All right. So let's really quickly um, say a prayer, bow our heads. Dear God, thank you so much for this life. Thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to live, walk, dwell among us. Thank you for sending him to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. God, today, one, we just ask that you give Tara's family strength in this trying time. This is a rough year for them. Give them strength, give them hope. Give them courage, cover them, protect them. Give them your inexplicable peace. God, I specifically ask that you bring all of you and none of me and just use me as a vessel. I am here. I am here. I'm completely submitted to you to get your word across. These and all the blessings we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, let's look at this scripture. I'm so excited. <laughs> all right, so first things first is we are going to go over to Luke 8, 40. Um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to start with Luke 8, Luke 8, 40. Now, I talked about this scripture in the past, and we did some Bible studies on it, and I always make a, 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 I try to make a note to always rightly divide my opinions versus what is actually in the scripture, right? Like, I'm just here to just to show y'all what's in the scripture. And so I said something when we did this, when we studied the scripture before, we're going to look at these two parallel stories where Jesus heals the woman with the issue of blood and he heals a little girl back to back. And when we looked at this before, um, when we looked at this before, I suggested and I specifically said, hey, I think that the way that this story is told is some kind of way where God is, this story is told back to back because we want God wants to show that this young woman and this old woman is some kind of way, either very similar or one in the same. And I said, I don't, I don't, this is just my opinion, but it's not here. It doesn't say that. <laughs> Let me be very, very clear. Okay. And so I think we had like a little talk at the end and someone was like, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I agree with everything else you said. And I was just like, you know, that's just my opinion. It's just, I, you know, it's what I, what I choose to believe, but it's not in the scripture. And so I was wrong. I think, I feel like I was wrong. I think what the scripture was trying to point out by telling these two stories back to back is this power of the tongue. The, the moral of this story is lost in translation, unfortunately, but we are going to look at the original text so we can see and is revealed to us what really happened here. So let's tell these stories back to back and um, let's get it popping. All right. Here we are, Luke 8, 40. I think it's Luke 8, right? Yes, Luke 8. Luke 8, 40. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out of me. Then the woman, seeing that she could 
not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell to his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, this is what I really want you to see, this particular line. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. This is another line I want you to notice. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but when he ordered them not to tell anyone, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Let me back up. There's another scripture that I want to show y'all before we even really, really dive into this. Okay. Um, just hold on. It, it just really, it, it came over me just now. Just bear with me really quickly. Um, I think it's in Luke one. All right. I got to tell y'all this story too. This is really honestly what brought me here. This is so, so, so important. I didn't even really, no one talks about this, but this is so important, especially when we talk about the power of the tongue. Okay. Ty, you won't really trip out when you see this. All right, so this is telling the story of John the Baptist. This is before Jesus was born. This is Luke 1. Luke 1. This is telling the story of John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist is J Jesus' cousin, okay? And so the scripture foretold that one is going to come right before the Savior to prepare the people's heart. So we already know J John the Baptist was in the wilderness and baptizing people. He baptized Jesus, okay? But before that, Jesus and John actually met when they were in their mother's womb. That's a whole nother type, topic to talk about. But I want to show y'all this. John's mother's name was Elizabeth. Elizabeth and Zechariah was old. They ain't have no kids, okay? An angel came to Zechariah and told him, you are about to have a child. Okay, so let's, let's pick up on that. This is before John and Jesus is born. Okay, just putting that into context. Um, uh, let me just, just show you here. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, talking about Elizabeth and Zechariah. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. They were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Okay. So fast forward. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, talking about Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear your son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn their hearts hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you 
this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. Then his time of service was completed. He returned home. After this, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth in the town of Galilee Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Okay, so let me just, I'm going to pause here because we're about to go into Mary and Joseph's story. But I want to point out to you, let's just recap this story. I got lost in this. If you read this, you will read it like so. Angel came to Zechariah and said, hey, you're going to have a kid. Even though y'all old and y'all have a lot of shame about the fact that y'all old and didn't have any kids. Zechariah said, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is a well, a long well in years. This is an angel coming to talk to him, okay? And so he starts to doubt. And so if you read this, you will read it like Zechariah got punished for not believing the angel. But that's not necessarily what happened. Let's read the order. The angel said to him, I'm a Gable. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak. Okay, da, 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 da. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. He's not necessarily being punished because the Bible will say you are being punished. He can't speak because he has so much disbelief and he's about to mess it up. John the Baptist is a part of the prophecy. He's an important part of the plan. He prepared a whole generation for Jesus. He also baptized Jesus so that the Holy Spirit went on him. If you also see in the scripture, there was a long period of time while Elizabeth was pregnant that John didn't move. And so when uh, when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, with Jesus in her belly, John leapt in Elizabeth's belly. Okay? You take that how you want to take it. But my point that I'm making is the angel didn't play. The angel knew how important it was for him not to mess it up while she was pregnant. What would have messed it up? his words so he couldn't even speak you know what I'm I'm done with you you can't even speak and so the reality is some of us need to be restricted on speaking until we can get it under control that's how powerful words are It's not just the faith or lack thereof. It's the words. Zechariah almost messed it up. Okay. Somebody posted something in the chat. God saved him from himself. God saved all of us. John was important. Jesus talks about how important John was. Okay. So I want you to see that I'm, I'm going to dance here just a little bit. I really want you to understand that you are messing it up for yourself with your own words. And this is what I was doing. This is what I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a human becoming, not a human being. This is what I am doing as I'm learning and open my eyes and see. As I'm still stumbling in this area.
Okay. Now let's go back to Luke eight. Let's look at these. Let's look at how Jesus used this to heal these two women. Now, let me, let me first, um, there are some things that we're going to have to deduce from the text. Let's go back to these, these two stories. Okay. Jesus was in a crowd, a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, crawled over to him. Women wasn't supposed to touch the priests, crawled over him, touched the cloak, the hem of his cloak and was instantly healed. Jesus turns to her and says, daughter, you have been healed. Then he goes in the midst, in the midst, this is right before he's about to go to Jay Iris. Jay Iris begs him, hey, come get my daughter. He goes, he, after he healed the woman with the issue of blood. Now, keep in mind, right after he healed the woman with the issue of blood, he says to her, um, he says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. This sentence is so packed. I don't even know. Like, I hope I can do it justice. When we, when we are the ones causing our own harm, right? And so when we can assume that this woman really was causing her own harm, by the statement that Jesus said, daughter, your faith has healed you, which means that she was lacking in faith before, okay? A lot of times when we have a ailment, whether it's spiritual, emotional, physical, it comes down to something that where we feel inadequate guilt shame that's essentially what it is some area where we feel inadequate okay now it's important to know that before this woman was healed right before she was healed jay iris's peeps or jay iris came about healing his daughter. Okay. This is, this is like really so much for women who don't have relationships with their father. This is really what it's really all about. Jay Iris came, ran, fell at Jesus's feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl about 12 was dying. When a girl is young, about 12, or a boy, we really only have one or two resources of hope to solve our problems. And really, it's our parents, okay? And see how this man rode for his daughter. Now, we will look at this text and we assume like, oh, of course, this will be the case. Yeah, you're supposed to ride for your daughter, but we already know that there's so many parents out there that won't, that don't do it. Not that they won't, they just don't have the capacity, they don't do it. Some of us are in this room, our, our fathers disappointed us, our mothers disappointed us, but this man rode for his daughter, okay? He was a synagogue, he was a Jewish leader. We know that the synagogue leaders didn't mess with Jesus. So this man went out his way. He's like, yo, I heard about this guy, Jesus. My daughter is sick. I got to do what I got to do. So he goes and I'm like tearing up because of the love that this man had for his daughter. He goes and he goes to find Jesus, falls to his feet, pleads with him. He, Jesus didn't get a chance to do anything about it. 
Immediately this woman comes who is sick. Now put yourself in the shoes of the little girl that we haven't even gotten to yet. I know I keep going back here. Put yourself in the shoes of this little girl. We only have, when we're young like that, we only have one resource for solving our problems. And that's our parents. Not even when we're young, when we're old <laughs> too. Like <laughs> I went through some stuff. I was in Philly. I'm, I'm going to my dad. <laughs> I'm stressed. I'm going to buy my daddy. I'm going to tell my daddy on you. Okay. And that's what happened. I flew 3000 miles pregnant. Okay. And so she's relying on her father to solve her problem. And so this woman comes up and she's been sick for 12 years. Now it says she's a woman. We don't know how old she is, but she very well could, because she's been sick for 12 years. She very well could be 20 or 21, 22. She could be 24 or younger to where as though her bleeding started when she was 12 or younger. So if her bleeding started when she was 12 or younger and no one rode for her like that other little girl's dad did, where do you think her issue is? Where do you think her guilt, shame, her, what is she, when she goes to sit on that therapy couch with that therapist, what do you think she's talking about? She's been sick for 12 years. The Bible don't got a problem with saying somebody's old. Just talking about how Elizabeth was old and Zechariah was old. So she was probably young. So that means she had this sickness from when she was young. And mommy and daddy didn't save her. So I'm asking y'all, what do you think her real issue is? Love from who? Her dad, her mom, they didn't take care of me. They didn't take care of me. I've been bleeding for 12 years. My parents didn't take care of me. Okay. Let's go back to the, to the line. She touched him and now she was instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. So if her issue was a mommy daddy issue and Jesus calls you daughter. So like you got mommy daddy issues. You, you got an issue with your dad. You got an issue with your mom. At the end of the day, the thing that you're, when you have mommy daddy issues is, Hey, you ain't treat me like a daughter. That's usually what the thing is. So I've seen people talk about their moms, talk about their dads. You ain't really back in the day. I am over this because you did not treat me like a child. You didn't treat me like a parent should treat their child. You didn't rob for me when I was a child. And so when Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Guess what he did? He used his mouth to declare to her that you healed yourself because now you see yourself as what you always wanted to see yourself as a daughter. So he sealed it by saying daughter. Your faith has healed you. Now you see you as who you want to see yourself as. This thing you've been struggling with for 12 years. All right. We don't got a lot of time. I want to hang out there, but I can't. Okay. So let's talk about this other woman. 
We got, I wish, but this is a two hour Jimmy jam. Okay. Let's talk about this other woman, the girl. Okay. Jesus goes to the girl. We already know she's dead. Let's quit with these games. She wasn't, she was dead. Period. Point blank. While he was still over there with the woman, dealing with the woman, one of Jay Iris' servants came and said, hey, um, your daughter is dead. Here we go. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Leave him alone. Your, your daughter's dead. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in except Peter, John, and James. I want y'all to also peep. He only took the three, his, his right hands. He didn't let anybody go in. You know why? Because when they got there, everybody was standing outside the house. When he brought the house, he was another. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. So he knew that he needed to take people in with strong faith because they were already out there mourning for this little girl. So he didn't let the people that like he did what they did to Zechariah. I shut everybody up. We, we're not going to let y'all come in. Okay. He tells everyone, stop wailing. Y'all vo- y'all's mouths is about to mess it up. Stop wailing. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him knowing that she was dead. The scripture said, knowing she was dead. I ain't say it. The scripture said it. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Now I want to show you something. As it pertains to this girl who was sick. If you're a little girl and you're sick on your deathbed, what would you be afraid of? Right? We got to the root of the cause of this, uh, this other woman. Let's get to the root of the cause of this little girl. You're a sick little girl. At this point, she's 12. She may not have a bunch of issues. But you, you're sick on your deathbed. What would your big issue be? I'm going to assume that her big issue is I'm not going to grow up. I'm not going to be a woman. I'm not going to grow up to see womanhood. I'm not going to be, see, but I'm, when you're a kid, all you think about is when I'm growing up, when I'm an adult, when I'm an adult, when I'm a grown woman, when I'm this, when I, that's all you think about. That's all I thought about when I'm an adult, I'm out of here. <laughs> okay. So notice how he says, my child, get up. Now, before we even go into that, this is where we got to look at the scripture. Okay. Because uh, the King James Version translates it differently. And so I'm already going to tell you, I looked at the scripture. The word that is used here is pais. And so I want you to see, I'm going to zoom in. I meant to zoom in earlier. I want you to zoom, see here all the translations, all the areas where this word, because a lot of times the words don't translate exactly. All the translations, what this word pais means, okay? And I can, I'll, we, I'll, I'll, I have the exact definition, but here's the different places that the word pais is used. Servant, 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 child, boy, child, boy, child, maid. Huh. So Jesus speaks to this girl. Now, here's what, here's what the definition of, of, of pais is. It's a word for both child and young person, male and female. It's also uh, denote a slave at any age or a servant at any age. So this girl was dead and he speaks to her and uses the tongue to speak to what her issue was, which I'm sure at that moment, right before she finally slipped, her issue was, I will not be able to see adulthood. I will not be able to 
serve myself, my hopes, my dreams, anything. And so he calls her servant, or even if he calls her child, a child is a living, breathing thing. You can only be a child if you're alive. But King James Version says, maid, maiden. You can't be a servant if you don't have some sort of maturity about you. Okay? And so I want you to see Jesus is using these intentional words. This is not just language that he called everybody daughter. He doesn't call everybody daughter. He called this little girl who was a daughter, maid. Then the woman who was clearly a maiden, he calls her daughter. The other thing I want you to see here is this is so appropriate. I really want you to pay attention. That usually the area where you are struggling with most is back to some sort of title that you are trying to get. This is why I name this Titles Matter. I want to show y'all one more thing. These two, I'm, I have to fly by. I have to fly by really, really quickly with. But um, my one of my favorite ones is... Um, uh, all right, let's talk about the woman who is at the, um, the well. I don't have enough time. I, I can't read the whole thing, but it's a very famous story. Jesus and, 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 and the disciples were traveling. They had to stop at a well. Jesus was tired. They're like, hey, let's go get some food. He sends the disciples away to go and get food. He comes to this well and he meets this woman and she's there by herself. She says, um, He says, hey, can you draw some water for me? And she's like, you don't even got nothing to draw with. Like, why are you bothering me? Mind you, she's not Jewish. I mean, they're, she's Samaritan. They're a very different type of sect of, um, from the house of Israel, okay? Very different. The Pharisees and Sadducees didn't deal with them at all. So he says to her, um, hey, uh, you know, give me some water. She's like, you don't even have nothing to draw with. Like you didn't come here for water. And so they get into this conversation and he mentions like, yeah, you know, your husband. And she's like, I don't have a husband. He said, you're absolutely right. I'm glad you told the truth. Actually, the man you live with right now ain't your husband. And the last five guys, you know, you've been married, you've been married five times and the man you live with now ain't your husband. And so she, he earns her respect and he, she starts to see who he is. Okay. And then realizes that he is the savior. She then based on this dialogue that they have, she then goes back and runs and prepares Samaria for him because she starts telling everyone about who Jesus is. Okay. Then they, then he find they finally go to Samaria and they all welcome him because this woman went back and told everybody. I, go, I did a Bible study about that. That was deep too, about why this woman was so respected and how we know from the text, but that's neither here nor there. What I do want to show you though, is as he's convincing her of who she is, in line 21, it says, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the father, neither on this mount or nor in Jerusalem. Now keep in mind, she's been married five times and the man she lives with now ain't her man. We live in a different day and a different time. And I'm not here to judge anybody because I definitely could be judged. Um, but way back in that time, if you had five dudes and you've got a dude now that you shacking up with, what do you think her issue is? 
as we're talking about issue issues, what do you think her issue is? Now I want to show you. He says, woman. Now she looking for love. Okay, all right, all right, all right. But it's a little more specific than that. He says, woman. I want to show you this. This is when I was like, oh, we got to talk about this in Bible study. Okay. <laughs> um, let's look at that word woman. The word woman is gynai, gynai, gynai. I'm assuming it's gynai because it's come from the word gynecologist. Okay. So this is the wo word woman, G-Y-N-A-I. That's the Greek word. Let's see what where it's used and how it's used. Y'all minds about to be blown. I ain't scroll down yet. Okay, so up here, Matthew, it means woman, 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 woman. Wife. Wife. Jesus called her a wife. That's all she wanted was to be a respectable woman. She wanted to be respected by a man. He called her a wife. He just told her, you're not married. He called her a wife. And just in that moment, she was emotionally healed. Now, Jesus knew here the dope thing about this, right? A woman who, I only know this because I have experience in this area, okay? <laughs> a woman, we talked about this in Bible study before. She was witty. You read the text, you could tell she was very, very witty. She wasn't dumb. She wasn't just like a random HOE. Very witty, very smart woman, very clever, okay? It's so much in this text that you can read and deduce a lot of things about her whole vibe. But a woman who has had five men committed to wanting to marry her and got another man shacked up with him. This woman knows how to earn the respect and trust of a man because she's intelligent. So Jesus had this conversation with her because she then used her influence over men because she was so influential. She was one of those women that knew how to just influence people. So instead of influencing men in the bed, she went and influenced men to come to Christ and prepare that whole entire town for him. This one woman. But she couldn't do it until she knew that she earned this title that she had been desperately seeking. She couldn't fulfill her purpose. God gave her a gift to influence people, but she had been perverting it. She had been using it for the wrong thing. But she couldn't use it for the right thing, which was to bring people to Jesus until she saw herself as the title that she has been so desperately seeking. This is why words, titles matter and whatever it is where that's got you stuck. You have to know that you are already it. You are working so hard to be it. But God already sees you that way. And his opinion is the only one that matters. I want to show you one, one, one more, y'all. One more. Um, uh, 
Um, JD gonna come in here in just a minute. Oh, here it is. 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 I know. I know. That's why I wanted to talk about this. This is why I couldn't wait. Okay. All right. I'm going to just show y'all one more time. All right. This is when they, Jesus is in a house. Everybody's there. So many people there. And I'm just going to read it real quick. One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some in carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, I'm about to cry. I don't even know. I don't need this. Ain't even, the friend ain't even my issue. Maybe it is. I don't know. But I'm, I'm going to tell you why I'm about to cry. This man was on a mat. He got a bunch of people to cut a hole in the roof for him to see a man that was rumored to heal people. He has some ride or die friends. Got some strong friendship. I'm going to tell you right now, not all of us got people who will be willing to cut a hole in the roof for them. A hole in a roof? Just imagine what type of person he was. So we can imagine what type of person he was to those people. So what do you think his issue was? His issue was that he worked really hard to be a friend to them because he wanted them to see him as him as a friend. That's what his issue was. Okay. And so he's working hard to be a friend. Working hard to be a friend, working hard to be a friend, working hard to be a friend, working, working. What you need? What you need? I'm on a mat, but I got you. You need me to transcribe it? What you need me to do? You need me to <laughs> you need me to send some text messages? What you need, friend? What friend? What I got your back, friend? I'm on a mat. I'm laying down, but I got you. You want me to rub your feet? I got you. So when it came time for them to have his back, they had his back. And so Jesus says to them, Jesus says to him, You're a friend. Your sins are forgiven. You're a friend. You made it. You're a friend. And so this is where the conversation starts, where they say the Pharisees are mad and says, "Why? He, he, this is blasphemy. Blasphemy means you represent yourself to be a God and you're not. How can you forgive sins? Only person that can forgive sins and God. And Jesus says to them, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. So they're, they go hand in hand. So that thing, that title that you are trying to. So really get. The reason that you're trying to get to get that title so bad. Is because you got. Sin consciousness, you are guilty somewhere about what someone did to you someone didn't do for you a parent that wasn't a parent someone that didn't have your back or how you were a horrible friend to someone else or whatever it is you working hard to block that thing out and so now here jay's throwing something at the door and so now here you are you working so hard to block that thing out that you now sick finances is sick emotionally sick you work that hard to blot that thing out to get the title that you don't even know all you got to do is call yourself the title 
and you'll feel better. Whatever that title is. And call yourself the title. Go into deep meditation. Sometimes I go into deep meditation and without I have this weird thing where I do where I just picture myself with God and I just ask him the question. The first thing that comes to my mind and that is how I allow him to communicate with me. And there's been times where I've literally said to him, God, I just want to make you happy. I'll never forget this day. I'm like, God, I just want to make you happy. He said, I'm already proud of you. There's nothing you can do to make me not proud of you. And so you're working hard to block some made up thing in your mind out. I'm already proud of you. I've been proud of you. How was some years ago when he said that to me? You're working hard to, to be a daughter. You're working hard to be a successful person. And God has said, you're already successful. You already got I got you. Stop working yourself hard to where you're sick. But don't, the only thing is. You got to be okay for when you sit down and have this conversation that the title, the title that you're chasing is subconscious. And when you realize it, you got to be okay with that title might be something stupid. And you got to be okay with that. You got to be completely honest. Right? Like friend. This man worked so hard to be a friend that he made himself sick. We've done that many a times, been there, been, been there so much for other people that we make ourselves sick. And God is like, you don't have to do that. You are a friend. You did it. You are a good friend. Look how these people got your back. Hold on, let me tell her to bring him. Hold on. Thank you. Mm, I knew, I knew it was going to be a good one. I knew it. This is why I, um, why I came out of my little shell real quick and taught this class. Anybody have anything they want to verbally say? I'm talking and I'm crying. So I know y'all crying in the house. <laughs> if y'all crying, it's okay. Y'all have to talk. This deep, ain't it? I know. I know. When I was reading this, God let me know about some titles that I was messing around trying to chase. And it immediately made me feel better. We have these moments where we want to be so much and we don't see the things that we are already the thing we want. Oh, thank you, Ty. All right, let's bow our heads. You want to say a prayer? Let's say a prayer. Mm. Come on, stop, you little gremlin. Mm. Come on, JD. Let go of my hand. I'm going to say a prayer, and then I'm going to hang up. All right, dear God, thank you so much. Thank you for this word. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your power. Thank you for living inside of us. God, thank you for just you being you. Thank you for my gremlin child who I'm, is not allowing me to properly pray. But we know 
that you love us. And we are the thing that we are seeking. Thank you for just allowing us to see. These and all the blessings we ask in Jesus' name. My child is getting into everything. Amen. Amen. Good night, ladies. Good night. Hey, Lita. Good night, y'all.